This video, we're going to talk about functions, and in particular, what's it mean for uh, a function to be well-defined, injective, surjective, and finally bijective. And along the way, we'll look at some examples to try to illustrate those concepts and how you check these properties. So before we uh, jump too far in, let's kind of zoom out a little bit and generalize. You know, we talked last time about functions and how it's this idea that it's a correspondence between two sets. Um, where for each element of the domain, there should be a unique element it's associated to in the codomain. So what we're gonna do is generalize that a little bit. What if I take that requirement away? What if I just have a correspondence between two sets? Nothing else assumed. So given two sets A and B, then a relation from A to B is just any correspondence from A to B. So like, you know, one element could be associated to more than one element, and that's, that satisfies this definition of a relation here. So a little bit more of a general concept here. Now, if we try to relate this to what we've been doing, a function is a specific type of relation. And what do we do when we've got a function? We require that each input has a unique output. So again, functions are specific types of relations. Now, what's maybe a little bit unfortunate is sometimes these words like relation and function and mapping, they're all kind of used uh, synonymously here. So like sometimes you might see the word function and it's not assumed that it has that property that the input goes to unique output. Again, sometimes we're just a little bit loose in how we use these words. So uh, what you might see in such a case, what authors are really careful to do that, you know, if they are using function in this more general terminology and they really mean a relation, you'll see this uh, phrase well-defined. So that's the property we're going to talk about now. So this property of having the input be associated to a unique output, that property is called the well-defined property. So we'll say that a map or, you know, a relation will say that it's well-defined when it satisfies that property that each input has a unique output. And how you'd write that in symbols is if a1 is equal to a2, where as you guessed, a1 and a2 are perhaps elements of the domain, uh, so if you've got the same element of the domain, then uh, it has to correspond to the same element in the range. So again, each input has a unique output is what that's trying to say. Of course, that's just kind of in symbols what you would take to be the definition of a function from, you know, like a college algebra class, say, you know, that's telling us uh, about like the vertical line test, if you want to think of it that way from college algebra in that context that you've got a function from R to R, say. But just more generally here, each input has a unique output. Each input has exactly one output is another way to say that. So uh, if you're asked to check if a function is well-defined, this, this definition in symbols here is what you have your hands on. That's, that's what you're going to use in order to show a particular functions well-defined. So just to give you an example of what that would look like, we're going to show that uh, my favorite function f of x equals x squared is well-defined. And so how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to start if a1 equals a2, right? So then those are just two real numbers perhaps where we're saying, oh, in fact, you've got the same real number. I wanna be able to conclude that f of a1 equals f of a2. So what are we gonna do? Well, how can I get f of f into the picture here? It looks like f just squares stuff. So what happens if I square both sides of this equation? Well, I know my algebra rules say I can do whatever I want to an equation as long as I do the same thing to both sides. So when I square both sides, I get a1 squared equals a2 squared, which is the same thing as saying that f of a1 equals f of a2. So what did we just do? We tracked through if a1 equals a2, then we see f of a1 equals f of a2. So again, that's always what you want to be able to do. That's kind of your scaffold for how do you show something's well-defined. Moving along. We're going to say a function from a to b is injective. Another word for that, or maybe phrase for that, is one-to-one -one if it satisfies the following. And so here what we're going to assume assume that f of a1 equals f of a2, in other words, you're dealing with the same output, it better be the case that the inputs were the same. So then a1 equals a2. So again, in um, you know maybe people words rather than mathematical symbols, each output has exactly one input here. If you think about it too, that's sort of like a converse to well-defined. We kind of switched where input and output goes. So injective and well-defined are commonly mixed up. Uh, students commonly mix those up. So try to keep those straight in your head. Okay, cool. So what would you do just to try to emphasize or illustrate rather, um, how do you actually use this, this property with symbols here in order to show a function that has a formula is injective. So I claim that uh, when you take a number and cube it, that's an injective function from the real numbers to the real numbers. So what are we gonna do? So to see this, we're gonna suppose f of a1 equals f of a2. So again, as far as like uh, 
from this definition up here, that's your foothold. That's where you start from. So suppose that that happens. So if that, and what do we want to do? Well, I want to be able to get to A1 equals A2. And so in my problem down here, I know what F does to A1 and A2. It cubes it. So this equation that I've written right here is the same thing as saying a1 cubed equals a2 cubed. And now what we could do is do some algebra. I know that I'm allowed to say take cube roots of real numbers and uh, a real number has a unique cube root. Whereas like, you know, if you, when you solve an equation like x squared equals one, you get two answers, right? You get a plus and a minus, but cube roots are nice. You just get exactly one answer. So when you cube root both sides of a1 cubed equals a2 cubed, you cube root both sides, you get a1 equals a2. And so we just concluded that, in fact, the inputs had to be the same as well. So again, I hope that you see how that yellow scaffold appears and how a typical proof that f of x equals x cubed is one to one. I hope you see how that scaffold helps you along through there. And you just have maybe some little baby algebra details to fill in in order to get to that end goal. All right, the next concept, we'll say, that we'll say that a function from A to B is surjective, and another word for surjective is onto, if it satisfies the following. So uh, here is maybe the uh, criteria that you're gonna check for any B, little b and capital B. So here, capital B is the codomain. If you remember from the previous video about functions, you know, the codomain is not all the outputs. The codomain contains all the outputs of the function, but I'm not saying everything in B is an output. So for anything that's in the codomain, you should be able to find an A in the domain such that f of A is equal to B. If you wanna track through what that says, that's saying that the codomain is equal to the range. So a function's surjective whenever the codomain is the range. In other words, if f's surjective, then this codomain, in fact, is all the outputs. So that's maybe the case that students try to assume from the get-go. But again, if you've watched my previous video, you appreciate that the codomain generally is not the same as the range. In the case that it is, then that says your function is onto or surjective, whichever one of those two words you want to use. So uh, what are we going to do? We'll just do a little example of how do we use this criteria here. This again is the definition in you know math symbols about what it means to be onto or surjective. So how do we use that? Just to illustrate how that scaffold works. So I've got my function, it's a little bit tiny but more interesting. It's not exactly like something you'd see in college algebra. Let's say I've got a function from the plane to the real numbers. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a point x comma y and what does f do? It just sends it to the x coordinate. By the way, too, like if you're the type of person, maybe you want to put more parentheses around here because like you're plugging this ordered pair into that function. You do you. I'm just going to keep them like this, though. So I claim that this thing's on to. So just to illustrate, what are we going to do to see this for any B in the codomain? So we should just let B be any real number. Now, what I'm going to do right below this is just kind of some of my scratch work here. What am I supposed to do? OK, I've got any arbitrary real number. I have to come up with some point x comma y that gets sent to B, so that F sends X comma Y to B. And you're thinking about it here, and again, what I'm doing right now is this kind of some scratch work that's in your head. Maybe it's not actually a part of the proof that you write down and you submit to your professor. But if you're thinking about this, well, any point that has an X coordinate and a B, when I plug it into this function, it would just spit out that X coordinate. So it would spit out B, that'd be fantastic. So you've kind of solved the problem. You see that there are, there are lots of things in the domain that get sent to B. And so all you need to do is just pick one and demonstrate it. So the point B comma one, so by the way, uh, back to resuming how like the proof might go, well then notice the point B comma one, that's definitely a point that's in the domain R2, is such that well, when you plug that into your function here, remember it just spits out the X coordinate. So you've demonstrated that you can find something in your domain that gets sent to this point B. And then now, you know, a little bit of set theory kind of things. You just did that for any B in the codomain. You just showed that any B in the codomain is an output. Therefore, that means that the codomain and the range have to be the same exact thing. So onto is sometimes a little bit more tricky, but again, I hope that you see this is the scaffold for what you go through. And then this is some of the thought process and kind of in general, what's a, a proof that a function's onto it looks like. The last thing uh, that we're gonna look at is we'll say that a function from A to B is bijective. Another uh, term for that, or different terminology for that rather, is one-to-one -one correspondence. So when you see those two things together, one-to-one -one correspondence, that's the same thing as being bijective. But what is it? It just means that it's injective and surjective. So it's both. It's one-to-one -one and it's on two. So whenever a function has both properties, it's bijective. So how do you check such a thing? How do you check that F's bijective? Well, you just check that it's injective, and then if that's true, 
then go ahead and check that it's surjective. It doesn't matter what order you do those two in, you could do surjective first, but the point is to be bijective, it's gotta satisfy both. So like if you're checking the function, if you're checking if it's bijective, and you start with injective and you see, oh, that doesn't work, and you're done. You know automatically it's not bijective, same thing. As soon as you see it's not onto, well then it's not bijective either.